welcome all to uh, today's NLM History Talk uh, being held virtually thanks to the outstanding staff of the National Library of Medicine and NIH Video Casting. Uh, my name is Jeff Resnick. I'm Chief of the Library's History of Medicine Division, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you who are watching remotely via our global live stream and all who are following us on Twitter using the hashtag NLMHistTalk. NLM's history talks are designed to promote awareness and use of NLM and related historical collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and the humanities. The series also supports the commitment of the NLM to recognize the diversity of its own collections, which span 10 centuries, encompass a range of digital and physical formats, and originate from nearly every part of the globe as well as uh, to support the diversity of individuals who use these collections to advance their research, their teaching, and their service. It's my distinct privilege today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Joanna Radin, Associate Professor in Yale University's Program in History of Science and Medicine. Dr. Radin received her PhD in History and Sociology of Science from the University of Pennsylvania. She's a historian of biomedical futures which means she cares about how people have imagined the life-changing potentials of science, technology, and medicine. She has specific interests in global histories of biology, ecology, medicine, technology, and anthropology since 1945, as well as history and anthropology of life and death, biomedical technology and computing, feminist, indigenous, and queer science and technology studies, as well as science fiction. Dr. Radin has published articles in prominent journals and popular media. She is also author of the book, Life on Ice, A History of New Uses for Cold Blood, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2017, the first history of the low temperature biobank. It is a history that has much to teach us about contemporary efforts to understand COVID-19. She is also co-editor with Emma Kowal, of Cryopolitics, Frozen Life in a Melting World, published by MIT Press in 2017, which considers the techniques and ethics of freezing across the life and environmental sciences. Dr. Radin is currently at work on a book that draws on the career of Harvard-trained physician-turned-novelist Michael Crichton to examine the history of bioethics and shifting politics of trust in science. Dr. Radin's talk today focuses on the history of a particular collection of data extracted and digitized from patient records made in the course of a longitudinal epidemiological study involving indigenous members of the Gila River Indian Community Reservation in the American Southwest. The creation, circulation, and eventual restriction of the Pima Indian Diabetes Dataset, otherwise known as the PIDD, demonstrates the value of medical and indigenous histories to the study of big data. The history of the PIDD reveals how data becomes alienated from persons even as it, as it reproduces complex social realities of the circumstances of its origin. Dr. Radin's talk is held today in cooperation with the National Endowment for the Humanities Office of Digital Humanities as part of the ongoing NLM-NEH partnership to collaborate on research, education, and career initiatives. And we thank our NEH colleagues for their co-sponsorship of Dr. Radin's talk. So, Dr. Radin, welcome, and thank you very much for your presentation today. We welcome you, and we look forward to hearing you speak on When People Are Data, How Medical History Matters for Our Digital Age. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, and I'm gonna mute myself. Great, thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I first want to start and say by saying um, thank you um, to all of you out there for welcoming me into your homes this afternoon. Um, I want to thank Jeffrey Resnick for the invitation to speak with you um, on behalf of the National Library of Medicine, which has been an invaluable resource for my research as well as um, the research of many of the students that I train. Um, I'm also grateful to Lindsay Franz and Elizabeth Mullen for their logistical support and, of course, to NEH for um, the support they give to make events like this possible. Um, I want to tell you where I am. I'm speaking to you from my home just outside of New Haven, Connecticut, um, which is built on unceded Quinnipiac and Hamanassets lands. I want to acknowledge this um, because it has direct bearing on the research I'm going to be sharing with you today about the enduring legacies of colonialism and the ways they shape our lives in 
for, in ways that we're not always able to see very easily. Um, in a nation built on broken treaties and stolen lands, there are no innocent places to stand. And a large part of what I've learned from doing work that has engaged me with indigenous communities as a white settler um, is that we have to live in contradiction and we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, this is what um, an image of things that have been happening in um, my neighborhood and near me um, over the last week. And I want to just speak a little bit um, from my own heart to say that it's difficult for me to know how to connect with you when I can't see you. This isn't obviously the normal way that I'm used to giving talks like this. Um, but especially in this moment where so many Americans are engaged in struggles for survival, not only in the face of the novel coronavirus that emerged late last year, but from the enduring effects of colonialism and systemic racism and the failures of care that are tangled up in there. This is the title slide for, um, for, the, for my talk. And what I want to start with is um, pointing out that um, indigenous Americans um, or indigenous peoples living um, and on lands that have been claimed by America and settled by America are um, among the most impacted by COVID-19. Um, I don't have the updated numbers for this week, but as of last week, these there were 5,317 cases in the Navajo Nation alone. And I have included the link and throughout the talk, I've tried to hyperlink um, these links so that you can click through if possible. Um, to um, get more details on this data and look at various kinds of epidemiological projects, collecting data um, for a variety of purposes. Um, I also want to point out that the COVID-19 epidemic, which is hitting indigenous communities especially hard, is intersecting with a longer epidemic in indigenous communities of missing and murdered women, um, which isn't something that's gotten the same level of attention, but it should. Um, so I'm posting here a link for a website called SovereignBodies.org, which is an indigenous-led organization um, that is trying to understand um, the intersectional um, dimensions of race and gender and sexuality. So I hope that you'll take some time to look at these kinds of resources. Um, and final kind of epidemiological um, project that's going on right now to try to make sense of um, the racial dimensions, the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 um, is this project, covidtracking.com, um, which I was able to access yesterday. Um, and there's just tremendous jumps in um, incidents of COVID-19, you can see here that um, black people are dying at a rate nearly two times higher than their share um, in the population more generally. Um, and these are questions that um, I think need to be understood or that data that need to be understood, not just in terms of a kind of um, innate biological susceptibility, but the product of long-term um, choices and commitments on the left on the level of society um, and so i want to share with you and to be honest in saying that um i'm not confident that what i have to tell you is what mo the story that i'm going to tell you that what is what most needs to be said right now in this time of crisis when people's attention is drawn in so many places um and maybe i'm most needs to be heard as a, as a white woman of considerable privilege um but I am speaking in solidarity with my black and indigenous friends, colleagues, students, and fellow citizens. And I am confident that history is one of the most powerful resources we have to address and understand the struggles of the present. So um, in what follows, I'm gonna offer these remarks in a spirit of humility and in solidarity. Um, and I hope that they're received in that way. Um, so I thought it might make sense in addition to situating myself amidst the present to tell you a little bit about um, how I came to work on the topics that I work on um, and what my research has dealt with. Um, the story that I, I guess I'm telling um, in some ways begins with research I began um, now um, almost 15 years ago um, in a basement in Binghamton, New York. Binghamton is a few hours um, northwest of New York City. Um, and what you're looking at here is an image of what's called the Serum Archive Lab, which is a collection of blood samples from um, 
because like I'm indigenous, members of indigenous communities from around the world, um, the oldest samples go back to the 1950s and 60s. Um, and I went there um, back in, uh, I believe it was 2008, um, to spend time trying to understand what it meant to take blood samples collected long before anyone was talking about sequencing DNA, and right at the beginning of the emergence of um, the science of virology, um, and the efforts to take those samples and make them useful and relevant um, in a genomic age, so to reuse them. Um, and at if I, I was writing this as fiction and not as history, it might seem a little bit on the nose um, that as I pulled into the parking lot of Binghamton University the first morning to do this work, um, I heard a podcast, um, or actually it wasn't a podcast, um, it was um, live radio, um, where Rebecca the author of the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, was talking about um, her study. This book had literally just come out. Um, and if I were um, able to see you, I would have asked um, the audience to share what they know about Henrietta Lacks. But at this point, um, it's quite... Um, well known that Henrietta Lacks was um, a black woman suffering from cervical cancer who um, went to receive treatment at Johns Hopkins and at the time um, her cancer cells were collected and wound up being used to develop what came to be the first quote-unquote immortal cell lines and this is a foundational um, technology in the modern life sciences and really transformed, radically transformed, um, how biomedical research is done. Um, you'll also know um, that um, decades later, um, after Henrietta Lacks's cells were, um, were transformed in tremendous ways, her family remained disenfranchised from health care in the United States. And this book helped to bring attention to her cause, to the way in which tissues get reused um, and wound up transcending the circumstances of their origins. And for me, this story really emphasizes the importance of thinking about the bodies upon which our science is built. So I found myself in Binghamton in this laboratory with the, the sort of ghost, in a way, of Henrietta Lacks, one woman looking then myself at freezers that were filled with tens of thousands of specimens from different people from all over the world. And what you're looking at here is a picture I took in the lab um, of an ordinary refrigerator that you might have in your kitchen, but it was used as a holding area. And you can see there's lots of interesting signs on it, like no food or drink. But I want to direct your attention if you can read it to the little wipe off, the blue wipe off board that has a message on it that says, blood will tell, but often it tells too much. I spent several years going back and forth to this lab and that message stayed on the wipe off. No one in the lab was willing to admit to having written it, but everybody had an opinion about what it meant. Everybody had a thought that blood um, and bodies were, were made through the language of science to reveal all kinds of things. They could reveal, for example, um, that you're not related in the way that you thought you were. They could reveal um, an issue of criminality um, or for, be used in forensic purposes. They could be used for medical purposes. Um, but what do we do with what blood and what other kinds of data that come from people say um, when we don't necessarily have a meaning for that, when they transcend the limits of the scientific potent, uh, article. Um, and it was this kind of work that also got me thinking about freezers as technologies of the future, both as literal ways of redirecting life and time, but also as a kind of metaphorical technology for thinking about how people imagine what the future will hold. Um, and if, if anyone is listening who's worked in a laboratory, you've probably encountered a Revco freezer or refrigerator. Revco actually um, uh, uh, stands for the Refrigerated Vending Company. They started before World War II. Um, dispensing ice cream, and then we're repurposed for scientific refrigeration. And here, um, I direct your attention to the top corner, um, the tagline, the future, comma, inside. And what we're seeing in this image is all of molecular biology swirling out of this freezer, um, giving us access to purportedly um, as yet unknown um, knowledge and answers to questions. So this idea that what you put in the freezer or what you collect and preserve 
that will reveal things in time. And it may reveal more than what you intended to or different than what you intended to. So these kinds of um, freezing technologies are able to turn living substance into a form of latent or potential life. But they're also sometimes perceived as a form of incomplete death. Freezers as a site where members of the communities who have willingly given blood and, and data for biomedical research have decided are insecure. In some cases, they've demanded that it cease being used for new purposes. This is an image that came from the New York Times a few years ago around a controversial case where members of the Havasupai community who live in the American Southwest um, found out that blood samples they had given to researchers at ASU at Arizona State um, to do research on their very high rates of um, diabetes and hypertension were subsequently being reused without their permission for studies um, of um, mental illness, alcoholism, um, as well as um, questions of ancestry and origins, evolutionary origins, which seem to scientists to be a relatively benign set of, you know, his purely historical questions, but to members of these communities threatened their sovereignty, threatened the ways in which they were um, situated on their, on their lands that had um, been um, restricted already um, through the reservation system. So I wrote about all of these topics in the book that, um, that was mentioned earlier, Life on Ice, A History of New Uses for Cold Blood. Um, and it was through um, the history of efforts to create contemporary biobanks and the tensions surrounding them that I started to think about um, different perspectives on um, biomedicine are valuable in efforts to make sense of life in an age of biological immortality. And it was this kind of research actually looking at um, fleshy um, um, bits of bodies, um, people um, in freezer, who were put in freezers that helped me to appreciate that similar kinds of questions of reuse are arising in data science. Um, and this is a subject of my talk today. So basically my method is to say, what can we learn from looking at histories of materials of things that seem like the opposite of data, what could be like more um, embodied than blood, and trying to ask what can we learn if we apply those same kinds of approaches to studying collections of data, okay? And someone, and I want to call attention to a scholar um, who has been enormously influential to my thinking, and if you're interested in these questions in particular of indigeneity and DNA, I highly recommend her work. Kim Tallbear is a professor um, uh, at um, University of Alberta in their Faculty of Native Studies, and her book Native American DNA is the authoritative um, take on the ways in which indigenous peoples um, have engaged with and resisted um, and, and reused their own, uh, to their own ends, um, genomic science. Um, so as we shift from this study, these studies of blood um, and DNA to other kinds of data, um, I want to just state my goals, which are to demonstrate the relevance of medical history to the emerging realities of big data that we've all heard about in different ways, and to bring visibility to indigenous people's involvements in science and medicine. So often um, indigenous peoples are um, erased from the stories we tell about science and medicine. And I want to um, emphasize that much of what we know um, about conditions like diabetes would not be possible um, without the engagement of um, indigenous peoples. It doesn't mean that we can't know things, but what we do know has been um, a result of research um, done with um, indigenous peoples. So I'm also hoping, if I still have it, to hold your attention. Um, and what better way to do that than give you an explosion, okay? So what you're looking at here um, is um, a fire that's happening underground um, in New York City um, where a manhole, which is like a cast iron cover, was um, blown off of um, the street because there was a fire happening underway. Um, why am we looking at this image? Because several years ago, I found myself in a conversation with a mathematician who was an expert in a field of problem solving called machine learning. And as she explained it to me, applications of her work served to do things like optimize Google search rank orders to make sure that people find what they're looking for or perhaps what they don't know they're looking for. 
And at the time of our conversation, she was using her expertise to help the electricity provider, Con Edison, predict such fires sparking in the power grid in New York City. These fat fires, in addition to disrupting electricity service, could lead to dangerous explosions of these manhole covers. So to address the challenge of trying to predict and prevent such dangerous disruptions to the power grid, she needed to test and optimize the predictive algorithms that were the coin of her professional realm. And this required access to sufficiently complicated, complex and validated data sets that would be used to feed the algorithm. And I asked her if she collected these data sets on her own to test the algorithms. And she said, no, um, I didn't realize what a naive question that was. And I said, well, where did it come from? And she gave me a list. She said, I'm working with a bunch of different data sets that are freely available. One of them struck a chord of recognition with me, Pima. And so as a historian of efforts to enroll indigenous peoples in bio biomedical knowledge projects, I knew that Pima could refer to members of an indigenous community who live in the southwestern part of the US. And I knew that the community had an extremely high rate of diabetes and obesity, which is what made them the focus of extensive research by epidemiologists, geneticists, and medical anthropologists. In 1990, those living at the Gila River Indian Community Reservation outside Phoenix, Arizona, were defined as having, quote, the highest recorded prevalence and incidence of non-insulin dependent diabetes of any geographically defined population. Today, members of this community, known to science as Pima, refer to themselves as Akmel O'odham, which has been translated as a river people. So I'm showing you here um, a map that um, was actually extracted from an NIH publication just to give you a sense of where geographically we are in the world. And on the top, there's a, it's, I apologize, it's a little blurry on my screen. Um, you can see Gila River. It's spelled with a G, so it looks like Gila River, but it's pronounced Gila River, um, is, is right up at the top. And that's the area that we're talking about. Um, and the political boundaries of this community, which was created in the mid 19th century is what made it possible for public health officials to conceptualize the reservation, which is one of the oldest in the United States, as a laboratory for observing the epidemiology of diabetes. So even before the rise of genomics, um, since the 1960s, medical information collected from Akamel Odom bodies has been regarded as a valuable resource for improving general knowledge about the disease. In the process, and this is the case study that I'm sharing with you today, it was translated into a digital form that would allow it to be reused for knowledge projects unrelated to diabetes or even biomedicine. And at the core of the history of data about diabetes among the Akamel Odom are questions about the origins, ownership, and reuse of personal and bodily data that fuel our information economy. The story of how participants in the National Institutes of Health longitudinal research on diabetes at Gila River became donors of data used to understand diabetes, and later how that data was used to refine algorithms that had nothing to do with diabetes or even to do with bodies, but to do with erupting manhole covers, is exemplary of the history of big data writ large. What makes data big isn't so much its size, but that's relevant too but it's its ability to radically transcend the circumstances and locality of its production. Computers and algorithms make that possible, but understanding the politics of big data also requires attention to creation and processing of the data itself. Not unlike con conceptualizations of diabetes as a problem of food justice, wherein metabolic problems arise from becoming disconnected from traditional foodways and land use, I'm arguing that the history of the data set known as the Pima Indian Diabetes data set, often referred to as PIDD, makes political and economic subjectivity visible in ways that are of enormous consequence to practitioners and participants in medical and machine learning. So just to tell you a little bit about this community, um, I'm, I'm calling them um, uh, Pima, when I call them Pima, I'm using the scient the name that um, settlers and scientists gave to the group. But they call themselves Akumel Odom, which means river people. And Odom refers to these, um, a series of federally recognized groups of which Gila River Reservation um, is one. Um, the reservation, um, 
is the, was the first reservation in what's now Arizona. Um, and it was fun to, and it, and it, um, and it emerged, um, um, at a time when there was um, agricultural um, downturn in agricultural prosperity of the tribe. Um, the construction of upstream diversion structures and dams by non-native farmers cut Pima off from the water of the Gila River. Remember, they were called the river people with devastating consequences. Um, anthropologists um, came to Gila River at the turn of the 20th century as part of the Bureau of American Ethnology. Um, the reservation system had already been in place um, and the anthropologists that visited um, believed that um, he was um, finding um, this group who had um, was undergoing tremendous change. Um, and even though missionaries and um, Bureau of American Ethnology officials urged assimilation of these groups, modern references were cropped from the already deliberately posed photos um, like this one that were published in, um, in one of the early anthropological texts that was written. Um, and what I found be um, especially poignant is that here is an image of art farming artifacts that were collected by um, an anthropologist um, named Frank Russell. Um, he was able to collect these artifacts because members of the indigenous of the community of the Akamala Odom were no longer able to use them because the land ceased to be arable. So he was literally um, salvaging tools of a society that was becoming um, increasingly unable to maintain their life ways. And around this time, another anthropologist um, named Els Herlishka, con considered to be one of the founding leaders of American physical anthropology, he reported only one case of diabetes in the population. This is in 1906. But over the next 40 years, those who lived on the reservation experienced mass famine and starvation, to which the American government responded with canned and processed food assistance. So between 1906, so Seven, um, and 1908 and 1955, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Health Program, and in 1953, when a 42-bed hospital opened, the Indian Health Service became responsible for providing comprehensive health care for the eligible residents of the Gila River Reservation. Um, and tribal members have since argued that the loss of their ability to properly farm the land combined with a change of diet is the reason why they have such high rates of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And such explanations have also been intermingled with um, newer genetic theory or then newer genetic theories such as um, human geneticist James Neal's controversial 1962 thrifty genotype hypothesis, which um, put forth that such communities develop genetic adaptations to help them survive during periods of famine. Um, and um, as you can see in the quote here, um, Neal observed when he visited the Gila River Reservation that certain problems to Indian health can much more easily be approached on the reservation than in Phoenix or Tucson, including questions of genetics. And so the reason I point this out is that I want to emphasize that the fact that um, indigenous, this indigenous community and other indigenous communities were located on a reservation enabled scientists that came to um, study them to imagine them as a kind of natural laboratory. They it kind of ignored the fact that the reservation was a social creation and saw themselves as having a group of people that they could study in a more bounded way that related more closely to the kind of non-humans that they had studied in the laboratory. So the work that wound up happening at Gila River has come to be defined as cooperative research between community members at Gila River and the NIH, and it formally began in 1963. And this is when the National Institutes of Arthritis, Diabetes, and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, which is now known, and I'll just abbreviate it as NIDDK, made a survey of rheumatoid arthritis among groups they referred to as PIMA, in Arizona and Blackfeet in Montana. So they weren't even looking for diabetes to begin with. They were looking for rheumatoid arthritis and they were stunned to find out that there were such high rates. So they began an observational study at Gila River. It was supposed to last for 10 years. It continued for more than 40. So beginning in 1965, every resident of the Pima study area, um, which is the Gila River community, 
of at least five years of age was asked to participate in a comprehensive longitudinal study of diabetes, which they were examined every two years. In 1984, um, this, um, the epidemiological subgroup that was um, running this became the current Phoenix Epidemiology and Clinical Research Branch, which over, oversaw the study. And in the 1990s, and it took until the 1990s, they came to oversee prevention programs, which were incorporated in response to criticism that while scientists had been observing the nature of um, um, diabetes in this community for um several 30 years, very little had been done to directly address or mitigate um, those issues. So at the turn of the 20th, 21st century, despite great advances about not in knowledge about diabetes more generally, there were no discernible improvements in ob obesity or diabetes rates among community members. Writing in the 1990s, two leaders of the project, Clifton Bogardis and Stephen Lihioja argued that the Pima Indian model of the disease, diabetes, affords major advantages, not least of all because the pop, I'm quoting, the population is genetically homogeneous compared to Caucasian populations, and therefore the causes of non insulin dependent diabetes are less heterogeneous, simplifying linkage studies. In other words, the legal and political boundaries of the reservation function to enclose the Pima making them appear as a natural laboratory in which to study diabetes. A 1996 pamphlet, the Pima Indians Pathfinders for Help, quoted Bogardus, who reported that these scientists have studied well over 90% of people on the reservation at least once. And this same document cast Akamila Odom as magnanimous donors of biomedical knowledge. And I'll just read a section of the quote. Um, it says, Quote, once trusted scouts for the U.S. Cavalry, the Pima Indians are pathfinders for help. The Pima Indians are giving a great gift to the world by continuing to volunteer for research studies. Their generosity contributes to better health for all people, and we are all in their debt. The Pima Indians' help is so important because of the uniqueness of the community. There are few like it in the world. As William Knoller, an NIH researcher at the reservation since 1975 and who's recognized as one of the world's 250 most highly cited researchers in clinical medicine, biology, and biochem, testified before Congress, he said, this study has contributed much to the world's current understandings of the causes and consequences of type 2 diabetes and its complications, for which we are indebted to this community. The year that Pathfinders for Health was published was the first one in which the NIH funded large-scale prevention programs involving Pima participants, raising concern that the publication itself, which you're looking at a page of, may have been produced only to help assuage local feelings of exploitation that they had been guinea pigs for the benefit of others. In the 1990s, the issue of compensation was direct was addressed by ensuring that those who participated in the study continue to receive medical care, um, but also $50, free transportation, and a, and a meal each time they received diagnostic testing. While Akamel O'odham continued what was understood by the NIH as donations on altruistic generosity by giving their DNA starting in the mid-1980s, I want to pause this epidemiological history to shift attention to a quite different area of expertise that was emerging in parallel, that of machine learning. Okay, so we're shifting from the reservation to computers. And spoiler alert, machine learning doesn't actually work like this, but it's hard to find an image that can make sure that you're still awake or listening, so here you are. Um, and machine learning, it's a subdiscipline of artificial intelligence that practitioners date back to the 1950s. And it focuses primarily on algorithms capable of learning or adapting their parameters based on a set of observed data without having been programmed to do so. An algorithm in its most simple form is a set of instructions or a code. Um, it doesn't have to be in a computer, um, but it's a form of software that organizes data to generate meaningful information. It's what allows computers to do computational work. Machine learning theorists are concerned with theoretical issues such as computational complexity, computability, generalizations. Algorithms are the coin of their realm. Data is used to refine them. The field is a marriage of applied math and computer science. 
Machine learning and the related field of statistical pattern recognition have been the subject of increasing interest to biomedical communities because they offer the joint promises of improving both the sensitivity and specificity of detection and diagnosis of diseases and of increasing objectivity of the decision-making process or purporting to increase objectivity. According to an early editorial published in the journal Machine Learning, quote, unlike psychology, machine learning is fortunate in that it can experimentally study the relative effects of nature versus nurture. The author of that, of that op-ed, who was based at um, UC Irvine in California, believed that by looking at unprecedentedly large amounts of supposedly raw data, machine learning could avoid falling into the trap of human biases. And it was at UC Irvine that an important resource was established to aid in this goal. Okay, this is the slide that you can return to if you're interested for a cheat sheet on machine learning. And here we are where I want us to be at the use a slide, um, a screen cap from the UCI machine learning repository, which is in the words of its stewards, a collection of databases, domain theories, and data, gener data, data generators that are used by the machine learning community for the empirical analysis of machine learning algorithms. So basically, it's an archive of data sets or a large um, library of data sets, kind of not unlike the freezers that I showed you earlier filled with blood. Okay. It was created in 1987 by um, David Aha, who was then a graduate student, and several other grad students at UC Irvine. And it began after Aha um, started to hear calls for such a repository at machine learning conferences. Like people would say, you know, if only we had the ability to get different kinds of data sets easily available, then we could test our algorithms and we could, you know, be able to um, have well validated resources. Um, Early on, there were issues of credit. Well, who owns this data? Um, data can be hard to acquire, and not everybody is always interested in making it available to anyone. These are questions of um, ownership and credit that are, um, abound in the scientific community, and you'll find almost everywhere if you look at them. Um, let's see. There was also concern um, of about citing about um, accuracy and how to cite and cite the data sets. So when we say issues of credit, there wasn't it wasn't so much credit for the the very um, origins of the data, but giving credit for the person who assembled the data set. Um, and by um, the 20, first decade of the 21st century, in spite of these issues of credit, um, the machine learning repository itself had been cited over a thousand times, which, is, which made it one of the top 100 most cited papers in all of computer science. But what's interesting is that um, David Aha, who created this repository, didn't even list it on his CV because he felt like this wasn't actually part of the publication process. Um, or he made, So he made his own connection to the repository somewhat invisible. But I had a chance to speak with him and interview him for this research. And he did acknowledge that the labor of encouraging people to donate their data sets actually contributed to raising his profile in the machine, in the machine learning community. Today, um, it's still available. You can Google it right now if you're getting bored with listening to me talk. Um, and the homepage for the repository includes recognition and thanks to the donors and creators of the databases and generators. Why am I making such a fuss about this um, machine learning repository? Because here's where it's all coming together. One of the oldest, until recently, one of the oldest data sets on file was the Pima Indians Diabetes data set, which was donated in 1990. The data set is often referred to by its initials, PIDD, and has, quote, become a standard for testing data mining algorithms to see their accuracy in predicting um, diabetic status from the eight variables given. These variables or attribute information were extracted from paper patient records. We're not talking about DNA or blood, but we're talking about these are the attributes you can see right here. So this was um, data that um, research NIH researchers were recording um, as they talked to people. And you'll notice number of times pregnant. This is the data set of um, 768 instances um, looking at um, 
asking people how many times they've been pregnant, but also doing um, recording the results of glucose tolerance test, blood pressure, skin full thickness, which is a classic anthropometric technique for um, uh, a variety of purposes that have to do with body type, sometimes with race, um, a two hour serum insulin test, body mass index, diabetes, diabetes pedigree function, um, which is to try to track um, inheritance, age, um, and this class variable, which is something that we don't need to worry about, which wasn't collected. Um, but basically, um, what we're looking at here is what could have been a sort of patient record um, that you might go to your doctor and give, uh, but that had been collected over a lot of time, um, and these wound up in this database. So no blood um, is going into a freezer, but just data. Um, and why, why, why? Why is there data about diabetes um, in this machine learning data set? And why is it so valuable? Basically, um, what you start to hear people saying is that, well, there's just lots of data already collect collected. So we want to work with data that is, is robust. Um, but diabetes is worth it to look at um, in the context of big data because it's a commonly occurring disease that is very expensive um, to treat. Um, and it also has terrible complications, which might be able to be prevented if we could predict it. This all sounds, you know, completely reasonable um, and, and appropriate. Um, I want to take a closer look, though, at what this is doing in, it, in this repository, a repository that's I want to emphasize not specifically about medicine or health or diabetes. It's merely there for people with algorithms. They're testing for any kind of resource, including when manhole fires erupt underground um, to use. And what makes the data set valuable is that people know that it can be used to reliably predict when um, people will develop diabetes in this data set. Um, but that's, all, that's what it does. It performs a certain sort of function. Um, what you can see here is that the donor, the original donor of the database, it's not anyone from um, the, uh, the, the Gila River Reservation. It's someone named Vincent Sigalito, um, who's at the Applied Physics Laboratory of the Johns Hopkins University. Um, and if you do a little um, digging, you see that um, the Applied Physics Lab is located not far from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, which was crucial for facilitating interactions between researchers and epidemiology and machine learning. Of course, the NIH is just down the road. Um, and what I became clear is that um, David Aha, who had been collecting and assembling resources for the machine learning repository, did a postdoc um, with with Sigalito at Johns Hopkins. And that's how the Pima Indians diabetes data set um, wound up in the data in the repository. The data set had been constructed by constrained selection from a larger data set um, by the NIDDK. Um, and as and you can see here, this is um, this is a screen cap that I took from the machine learning repository um, back in 2015. Um, no, in 2017, where you can see that the data set had been accessed 216,576 times. Um, so this is a very um, highly visited data set. But I still haven't made clear how we get from the Gila River Reservation to um, the Applied Physics Laboratory, which is best known for producing guided missiles, um, to um, how, how do we get from point A to point B? So what happens is you get in 1981, um, as these studies are going on, William Noller, who spent a lot of time working closely um, with people on the Gila River uh, Reservation, publishes a study, Diabetes Incidents in Pima Indians, Contributions of Obesity and Parental Diabetes. So trying to track this research. Um, and then um, that research um, winds up um, getting, you see Noller's also on this paper in 1988, winds up intersecting with people who are interested in developing new kinds of ways of using computers to predict diabetes. And in order to do that, they have to transfer those variables into basically like a punch card. So 
you can see where all these X's are in the holes. Um, this is like an early um, kind of computational technology where data that might have been listed in a patient chart is being turned into a form that can be digitized. And that digital knowledge is going to be used and fed into the computer to see if it's possible to use these variables to anticipate um, when di someone is going to develop diabetes, okay? Um, and I can't see you if you're to tell if you're following all of this, but I hope that you can see that what I'm trying to point out is that we have a large amount of messy data that's being collected and put in medical charts. It's then being translated into a, a, a smaller subset for a 1981 study, which is then being recoded to be used to test it in a 1998 study, 1988 study. And all of these studies are focused on diabetes. They're being done um, to feed into diabetes research. And you can see this is just a little bit from this 1988 pep, um, paper that they um, defined their population as being bounded by the reservation. They drew on longitudinal records and they defined diabetes based on the WHO definition, which is a whole other talk that we could talk about. And they declared this to be a well-validated data research. If anyone um, in the audience has worked with, say, um, model organisms or experimental organisms, you want to work with organisms that are well known because that that means that those re those your results are going to be more trustworthy to others because they're going to know oh yes like that was the basis for these claims being made now what surprises me is that we get from a situation where we're using um, data collected from indigenous peoples for diabetes research to by 2006 um, this database has become so standard that it's being used to teach people how to use R, um, which is one of the um, major statistical um, software packages. Um, so what we can see here um, is the description of a homework assignment for a class that is not really about um, students who are interested in medical or health information. Um, it's purely about teaching them how to use data. Um, and it's from there that this data set winds up being able to be accessed for all kinds of purposes. And this complex history that I've been telling you is effectively erased and that we all were told is that a data set looking at diabetes in Pima Indian women who are at least 21 years old of Pima Indian heritage living near Phoenix, Arizona, tested for diabetes according to World Health Organization criteria. But all of this information is um, uh, beside the point for a student that's just being asked to achieve a desired result. So um, we can see what, what's happened here. Um, the data set, like I said, by virtue of the fact that it was and continues to be, or had continued to be for many, many years, freely available, had been used to refine algorithms intended for knowledge discoveries that have nothing to do with diabetes. Um, I asked David Aha uh, when I talked to him, you know, why this data set? Um, why, did, why did he think it became one of the most popular, widely used data sets in this already large repository of data sets. And he said, well, diabetes seems important to people, so people seem to gravitate towards it. Maybe they have more trust in the way the data was collected. The data set wasn't overly large. Remember that it only had eight variables and it was less than a thousand um, pieces. Um, and the attributes were straightforward, easy supposedly to code. Um, what I, I'm kind of hammering on this because I want to point out that today's machine learning scientists don't often learn the origins of the data they feed to their algorithms. This could be a function of the values of quote unquote algorithmic objectivity held by members of the data mining and machine learning communities to become fundamental to the maintenance of these tools as legitimate brokers of relevant knowledge. The fact that this data is also considered to be naturally occurring, a neutral product of contingent circumstances of its acquisition is seen as one of its other advantageous qualities, even if the data itself, as in the case of the PIDD, is in fact a product of colonialism, economic struggle, and biosocial suffering. So where does this leave us? 
I want to spend the last moment with you um, thinking about the way in which people become data. I've told you this story about um, the status of um, members of indigenous communities um, participating voluntarily, as voluntarily as it's possible to do so under the circumstances in which they found themselves. Um, contributing to data that then wound up being used for things that had nothing to do with diabetes, even as they themselves continued to suffer from um, increasingly high rates of diabetes. And bringing it home to today, um, amidst um, a terrifying pandemic that we know is impacting um, people disproportionately on the basis of race and um, socioeconomic status, um, there's been a lot of celebration of um, these data collection technologies like contact tracing, um, but we're already seeing um, the ways in which people are recognizing, well, um, what are who's gonna benefit from this data? On the one hand, yes, we wanna minimize the circulation and suffering associated with COVID-19. On the other hand, who's designing these apps? What will happen with the data that they collect? What will they do with it? Um, what kinds of freezers are they putting it into? Um, and how will we even know? Um, and you can see one of this is a story um, that ran in the Washington Post um, just recently. It was actually um, last month um, that one of the first con um, contact tracing apps violated its own privacy policy. Um, and I, I don't know if I, I don't think I have a screen cap of this, but um, I know that many people in the um, early days of the pandemic were looking at New York Times coverage of the way in which cell phones were being used to see how people were moving. On the one hand, um, it's, it's possible to feel like, wow, what a powerful technology, what a powerful resource for seeing mobility. On the other hand, we should take pause and ask, what does it mean that um, private companies um, are able to have this kind of information and we're not really sure how it's going to be used? both in the present, but also how is it going to be used down the line? So why medical history matters to machine learning is because in this moment, when we start to hear critiques about um, the uses of data and their ethical uses, some people say, ah, well, let's look at bioethics. Let's just use the principles of bioethics and we'll make a data ethics. But I want to make a different suggestion that given the ways in which um, our, our attention to complex historical processes shows um, that sometimes even the best of intentions are upended by um, the momentum of the technological systems that people find themselves in, we have a chance to look at the history of bioethics itself to see where it hasn't afforded adequate protections and to maybe come up with a better way of thinking about how to think about the people um, that produce the data that we want to use responsibly. Um, we might think about the limitations of informed consent. We might think about what it means to compensate someone for quote unquote participation. Um, if I'm carrying my cell phone around while I go for a walk, am I actually participating in a study? What does it mean to have to opt out of a study as I had to do when my son was born last year? Um, I had to opt out of his data being used for research at Yale, which is where we receive our health care, um, rather than being asked to opt in. Um, I also think we need to reassess the principles of autonomy and privacy that have guided so much of bioethics decision making. When we think about communities as opposed to individuals, we get different kinds of ways of account of thinking of accountability and responsibility. And so as I move towards my last slide, um, I want to point out that any time you hear um, the phrase raw data, it's raw data. I want you to actually ask or think raw that data is always already cooked. We should be asking and returning to some of the food metaphors I started with, um, whose labor is involved in generating the ingredients? What kinds of efforts have been involved to prepare them? Are these ingredients ones that may lead to serious health problems or ethical problems or social problems? Is it possible to 
process data so much that it becomes unhealthy or unuseful. And what I mean here is it possible to reuse data so many times that it becomes so disconnected from the circumstances of its origins that pretending that there's anything natural about it um, is misleading. And perhaps most importantly, I want us to ask who gets to be at the table when these meals are served? Who's going to benefit from the uses of data that are built from people, not just indigenous peoples, but from all of us? This is the final slide. I'll leave you, well, penultimate slide, that um, the data set is no longer available. In the time since I published this paper, when I went back um, to check and find out how many times it had been cited, um, I found the below image, which is recently retweeted, says, I'm sorry, the Pima Indians diabetes data set does not appear to exist. The data set is no longer available due to permissions restrictions. I haven't had much success finding out exactly what happened, but I'd like to think that the histories of data that people like myself and others are starting to tell are making people think differently about what it means to reuse data, what it means to reuse data from people who continue to suffer for the reasons that the data was originally collected. Um, but I don't wanna leave you on a hopeless note. I wanna leave you with the idea of, um, of um, a group um, that has emerged called um, the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics, where more and more in, in young indigenous scientists are being trained um, not to reject science, but to help produce forms of knowledge that um, can be um, reliably um, serving their communities. And I feel tremendously um, inspired and excited by the ways in which um, these kinds of efforts can help us to produce forms of knowledge that are really durable because they don't erase the circumstances of their origins and because they engage people who would otherwise be regarded as research subjects and at worst objects as partners in producing knowledge that can support the flourishing of a broad, the broadest array of lives. So I thank you for your attention and listening to this story and I'd be very happy to follow up um, and hear your questions and I'm linking to um, the published version of this talk if you want to go and read um, more closely some of the claims that I've been making. Thank you so much. Dr. Radin, thank you very, very much for an outstanding uh, presentation this afternoon. Um, we have a few minutes for questions and the way we'll do this is through uh, for those who are watching, all who are watching online, uh, if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, a box that says send live feedback, and it's through that interface that you can send your question. Or if you are following on Twitter at NLM His Talk, you can use that hashtag or uh, instant message me uh, as I'm on Twitter uh, using my handle. Um, I do have... One question um, that's come in through a videocast website. Um, this is a question about data ethics. Mm. It seems that most, if not all, big data is now globally available, this individual writes. If we address ethical concerns in the US, does it do anything to protect privacy and personal rights when researchers in other countries are looking for data sets to build and test their own algorithms? That's a great question. Um, and uh, I have um, a comment and a reading suggestion. Um, the comment um, that I think is, is interesting is that in some ways um, there are much stronger um, data protection rules in other parts of the world than there are in the United States. So that's one hand, but I don't think that gets to the core of the question, um, which kind of to my mind is like um, um, an account of like, well, if they don't, if we don't do it, they will. Um, but also the way in which, um, you know, federal organizations like the NIH, which in the service of transparency, want to make data available because it's collected using taxpayer funds. But what happens is that by making it available to taxpayers, it also makes it available to the private sector. Um, so I know that's not exactly your question, but you're right to see that there are very, very complicated issues that emerge. And because I don't have a lot of time, I want to recommend the work of Sabina Leonelli, who is a philosopher of science who's done exquisitely thoughtful and accessible work on data ethics in the global scientific community. So I encourage you to check her work out. And it's L-E-O-N-I, L-E-O-N-E-L-L-I, Sabina Leonelli. 
Very good. Thank you, Dr. Rady, and thanks to um, the individual who sent that very insightful question. Um, we have time for one more question, if anyone wishes to send one in. I'm monitoring both our Twitter feed and the videocast link. And if we don't have any, what I would like to share, uh, we have a few individuals who wrote in, great talk, lots of food for thought, and equally, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Raiden, wonderfully thoughtful presentation. And in fact, uh, on those notes, uh, I'm going to thank you on behalf of the National Library of Medicine's History of Medicine Division for your valuable time, your fantastic expertise, and for working with uh, me and my colleagues uh, to um, uh, or, or arrange this talk at such a challenging time for everyone. And uh, again, I thank you, my colleagues thank you, and we wish you every continued success in your research uh, in the coming uh, weeks, months, and years at Yale. Thank you. It's so been a pleasure you. to work with you all. Likewise. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.